Hi, I'm Moshe Zeldman. Welcome to Schmoozing. We live in times of unprecedented change and confusion. The rise of cancel culture, the promises and the threats of artificial intelligence, identity politics. We live in a society where people are more digitally connected but are feeling lonelier than ever. And we're in a world that seems to be edging towards World War III. I believe that Judaism can shed light on all these issues. Schmoozing is more than a podcast. It's a community of thoughtful voices on today's important topics. I invite you to explore with me how Judaism can help us deepen our understanding of the times we live in, confront the challenges we face, and bring some light into this world. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Schmoozing. We are coming to you live from Sweet Home Chicago. Okay, not live. We're coming to you from Sweet Home Chicago. Um, Okay, it's not even my home. (laughs) But... I love the song Sweet Home Chicago, originally by Robert Johnson and uh, redone in an amazing movie by the Blues Brothers, Sweet Home Chicago. So here we are. We're here for a weekend conference with an amazing group of young professionals called J Life. And um, it's a Friday afternoon. I got an hour to do a little recording. So here we go. Today's topic is going to be artificial intelligence and free will, a big philosophical conundrum. Um, AI is all over the news these days what it means for the future of humanity, machines taking over our jobs, machines taking over our decisions, machines taking over the planet. So there's lots to talk about. We're probably going to have a few episodes where we really do a deep dive into the topic. But for now, I want to start just with a Jewish lens on what AI can do and what AI cannot do. So the topic is going to be AI, artificial intelligence, and free will. If I look at my own path towards becoming an observant Jew way back when in the 1980s, um, I have to say that my studies of AI at the time played a very large role. Um, I was fascinated by it from the first time I heard it. I always loved the idea of computers and programming in high school. I became obsessed with what programs can do and can't do and pushing computers in those days, these very clunky machines, (laughs) pushing them to their limitations. Um, And I went to university and I studied philosophy. I studied artificial intelligence. And uh, at the time, nobody knew what it was. It was a completely theoretical field. But I found it philosophically fascinating. The idea of somehow being able to emulate human thinking processes in a machine. In other words, if our brains are just a bunch of connected neurons, to what degree can a computer emulate what human beings can do with their brains? So I understand that just like I can add numbers, a computer has the neural capabilities of adding numbers the way we do, obviously much faster. Calculators can work faster by far than any human being. Um, But my brain is also the source of my thoughts. The brain is also the source of my imagination, my creativity, my feelings, maybe my consciousness, maybe my choices. There's so many things that go on in our brain. And somehow, if I can emulate all of the neural connections in a brain within a computer, then maybe a computer theoretically would be able to do all the same things a human being is capable of doing. That's going to be our question. So I'm going to start with a bit of a challenging exercise that my first AI professor gave us on our first day of class. He walks in the room, he takes a pen, maybe it was a piece of chalk, and he says, what's going to happen when I let go of this pen? So we said, it's going to drop. Sure enough, he let go of it and it dropped. He said, did this piece of chalk want to drop, decide to drop? Does the piece of chalk like to drop? No, it's just laws of nature. The chalk has no feelings, no thoughts, no opinions, no anything. You let go of an object, it will drop. It's called gravity. He says, okay, let's take it a step up. If I grow a plant in the middle of a room where there's sunlight coming in from one window, and I see that as the plant grows, it grows towards the sunlight, Is that because the plant desired to get sunlight? The plant likes sunlight? The plant chooses sunlight? No. Same thing. The plant goes towards the light because of a simple biological process. There's a chemical called auxin in the cells of the plant that responds to shade. When auxin is in shade, it grows longer cells. And because there are longer cells, the plant grows towards the sunlight. It's a chemical reaction. There's no fundamental difference between a plant growing towards the sunlight and the chalk falling towards the ground. The chalk falls because of gravity. The plant grows towards the sun because of the effect of photosynthesis and auxin. The professor says, okay, what if I take an ant 
and I put it on the floor. And the ant is crawling along, doing its thing, and then the ant smells sugar. And it automatically, instinctively goes towards the sugar and brings the sugar back towards the ants for the rest of the ants to enjoy the sugar. Did the ant choose to get the sugar? So if you compare it to a plant, again, there's a chemical reaction. Ants respond to sugar and not to salt. Why? Because that's how an ant is built. It's built into the chemical structure of an ant that it reacts instinctively to its environment, not that differently than the plant. So the professor says, so what about a mouse? A mouse that hides when it hears somebody coming. A mouse that likes to hide cheese. A mouse that feeds its children. A mouse is essentially a really big ant, much more complex. Mammalian biology and brain function is far more complex than that of an ant, but essentially it's the same thing. It's a small closed system of chemicals and hormones that respond to its environment. Mice will do what mice are programmed to do. You can train a mouse by putting it in a maze enough times and giving it a reward and punishment system, but all you're doing is you're changing the biology of the brain because the brain is attuned to find cheese. So, of course, we all saw where this conversation was going. (laughs) The professor's last example was, what about you? Your choice to go to university, your choice to fall in love with a certain person or be attracted to certain kinds of people, your choice to pursue a career, your choice to go on a diet, your choice to be uh, an early morning person or a late night person, how you feel about art or culture or moral values, how much of that is you and how much of it is that just the way you've been programmed, much like a mouse, to respond to your environment. So I found that idea very disturbing because it really calls into question whether or not we actually have free will. We think we make choices. We think we're responsible. We think that we take credit for making a good choice. And we think we should regret making a bad choice. But who says we have any choice? If I'm not that fundamentally different than a mouse, I'm just bigger and more complicated, that doesn't mean I have any free will. It's true that human beings are unpredictable. I don't know, even with two twins, I don't know how they're going to grow up and how they're going to be different from each other. Because at the end of the day, they don't have the exact same conditioning. Their parents don't treat them the exact same way. They don't have the exact same balance of hormones and experiences. One sits in one place in a class or one sits in another place. One has this set of friends. One has that set of friends. Even identical twins are going to end up being different. But it might not be because they chose to. It might be because their environments are slightly different. And those differences over time turn people into different people. So the truth is, if you look at a human being from a purely biological perspective, forget about God and soul and just pure biology, we're a big mouse and a mouse is just a big ant and an ant is just a plant on legs and a plant is just a piece of chalk that has more more of a mechanism to it. But essentially, we are a big, complex network of cells, hormones, things that influence us, and ultimately, we're just big machines responding to our environment. I think most biologists would agree that there's no argument you could make for free will within the closed deterministic system of a human being. I think many fields of psychology would also say the same thing. Freud, in his Letters on Psychoanalysis, I believe it was the 19th letter, said the same thing. We are so driven by our unconscious and subconscious desires that those really dictate our choices. We don't really make choices who to fall in love with. We don't choose how we feel about women. It has everything to do with how we were raised by our mothers. We don't choose how we relate to men. It's all largely determined by how we are influenced by our fathers. There are so many layers of things that drive us and drive our choices on a subconscious and unconscious level that it would be easy to make the argument that that's really what determines the quote unquote choices that we make. So it's true that human beings are far more complex than mice. That doesn't mean that a human being is any less deterministic. It just means that a human being is less predictable. According to biology, both me and the mouse and the plant are completely deterministic. Deterministic meaning we follow laws of basic physics. If I take a ball and I throw it, any physicist will be able to tell me if they have the exact conditions, exactly what kind of an arc it's going to make, exactly how fast it's going to go, exactly where it's going to land, exactly what kind of a noise it's going to make, because it's a very predictable system. It is deterministic. At the same time, 
But if I take that ball and put it on a pool table and shoot it against a bunch of other balls, it would be almost impossible to predict where all the balls are going to land. Not because it's not deterministic. It's completely obeying the laws of physics. There's no surprises. It's just such a complex system that we usually don't have the ability to predict exactly how it's going to go. We can look at a human being and say the same thing. I see this kid being born into this family with these inborn traits and this personality and this genetic disposition and these cultural social influences and this kind of a family history. So they'll probably turn out like this. Psychologists would say that. Why is it unpredictable? Because there's just so many factors beyond our control. We don't know every TV show the kid's going to watch. We don't know exactly how they're going to interact with everybody else in their school. We don't know lots of things about how they're going to experience the minutes of life and how they're going to affect them emotionally, consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously. So scientists would say that that child's life is still completely deterministic. It's etched in stone. They don't have free will. It's just hard for us to predict it because it's a very complex system like the pool table. I remember I was once giving a lecture in Australia. I remember it was actually a class on the topic of the age of the universe from a Torah perspective. And it was a room full of scientists that about 100, 120 scientists in the room at the observatory in Melbourne. And um, at one point in the class, I made some comment about making choices in life. So one professor way at the back of the hall puts up his hand and he says, Rabbi, did you say we make choices? I said, yeah, you can choose to look at it like this. You can choose to look at it like that. We all have our preferences. He said, well, what makes you think we make choices at all? Who says we make any choices in life? Our lives are predetermined by our biology, our conditioning, nature, nurture. So I said to him, as in front of the whole audience, I said, well, you did make a choice to put up your hand and ask me a question. And he said, you made a comment that triggered a thought in me. That thought triggered another thought, which triggered a feeling, which made me raise my hand and ask you the question. So I didn't choose at all to ask you this question. <laughs> so I was a little confused and I looked at him and I said, okay, but right now, right, we're having a dialogue in front of a whole room full of people. We're having a dialogue. I'm making points. You're making points. You're either going to agree with me or you're not going to agree with me. He said, no, I don't even know what words are going to come out of my mouth next. I'm programmed a certain way. I'm watching myself talk right now. I'm interested in seeing how I am responding, but I don't know what words are going to come out of my mouth next. So I was stunned. I really felt like, what am I going to say to this guy? So what I did was I turned to the rest of the audience and I said, okay, any other questions? So this guy put up his hand again and he says, Rabbi, you're not answering my question. I said, buddy, you're not here. You're not a living human sentient being. I feel like I'm arguing with a robot. I'm not going to waste my time arguing with a robot. So the whole audience laughed. He was a little embarrassed. I went on with the rest of the lecture. He came after me at the end and he says, tell me, you still didn't answer my question. What's the proof that we have choice? What's the proof that we have free will? How do you know that you're making any choices at all in life? So the truth is, I really didn't have an answer and I really found it very unsettling. So at the time I gave him the one answer that I could, I ended up finding a second answer that I was more satisfied with. The answer I gave him was, I don't think I can prove that we have free will logically or scientifically, but it is so deep in my personal experience of life that I am making choices and I'm responsible for my choices. I don't need external evidence for it. In other words, when I do something wrong, I deeply feel that I could have made a better choice and that I should have made a better choice. When I do something really good, I'm proud of myself. I look back and I say, I could have taken the easy way out. I could have shrunk away from that choice. I rose to the occasion. I overcame my instincts. I made a powerful choice. I deeply feel that. And what's interesting is when we make a bad choice, we do something wrong. We always have the voice in us that tells us not to feel culpable for bad choices. We always have that voice telling us, it's not your choice. It wasn't under your control. There's nothing you could have done any differently. Don't feel bad about it. But somehow, no matter how much that voice is prominent, we all feel a deeper voice, a deeper, more real, intuitive, strong sense of that's just not true. You know it. Don't play games with yourself. 
you know you could have done better. You know you should have made a better choice. We all feel that. No matter how much we try to deny it, there's the deeper voice in us that tells us it's true. You had free will. You could have made a better choice. So I came back to Israel after that trip. I gave it some more thought, and I thought, where does the Torah tell us that we have free will? So I spent some time just leafing through all the stories, all the different laws, all the commandments, all the speeches. Where does the Torah talk? So the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where God says, I place before you today life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. God's saying, I gave you choices in life. Make the right choice. I thought that was a very good source. It made a lot of sense to me. But then I thought, there's got to be more to it than that. I mean, free will is so pivotal. It's so central to what makes us human, to what makes up our emotional landscape, to what makes up our destiny, our choices in life, that it can't just be that Moses, in his final speech to the Jewish people, throws in one line where he says, by the way, you have free will. <laughs> it's, got, it's got to be more central than that. So I went to one of my rabbis, Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, blessed memory, and I asked him, where does the Torah talk about free will? I thought he would point to the same passage. He says, Moshe, it's every page of Torah. I said, what do you mean? He says, Adam and Eve had a choice to eat from the tree of knowledge. Cain had a choice of whether or not to kill Abel. Cain had to choose how to respond to God punishing him. Noah had a choice. Noah's children had choices. The whole story of Torah is a story of choices and the story of consequences of choices. And not only that, the Torah is full of commandments. Every single time God gives a commandment, thou shalt not, or thou shalt, what does it mean? It means God's giving you the choice. When God says, don't gossip, God's saying, I'm putting it into your hands. I'm telling you not to gossip. You clearly can. People clearly do. The choice is yours. I'm telling you not to. But the very fact of God commanding us is God saying, I'm putting it into your hands. I'm giving you the choice. There are consequences to your choices. So there's really two answers to the question of how do we know we have free will? There's an intuitive answer. We all deeply feel it, no matter how deeply we try to deny it. And it's Torah. If we have a way of knowing that Torah is real, the Torah is divine, then with Torah, we know that we have free will. So let's go on that idea. When the Torah describes free will, the Torah's construct, if you look in the, the writings of the rabbis and the writings of Kabbalah, they describe it like this. God created Adam by collecting the dust of the ground, forming the shape of man, and God breathed into him the breath of life. It's called nishmat chayim. The word neshama, the breath of life, is from that phrase. A human being is described as having a body and a soul. A goof, Hebrew word for body, and a neshama, the soul. So a human being is not just physical, like the biologists say. We're not just made up of chemicals. We have physical instincts, like all the animals and all the insects. That's part of our physical programming. But we also have a whole other half of us, a whole other dimension that's called a soul. And as much as the body is programmed towards physicality, the soul is programmed towards godliness, towards spirituality. As a human being, we are a combination of two different drives. My soul is pulling me in the direction of the good and the holy and the moral and the spiritual. And the body is pulling me in the direction of the physical and what's going to be gratifying to me. Now, if all a human being was, was a soul and a body, that still doesn't quite leave room for free will. I'm in bed. I hear my alarm. I decide to press this news button. And again, and again. And again, I look back half an hour later and say, yikes, I was supposed to be at a bed at 7. It's 7.30. What am I going to do? Not my fault. My body must have been stronger than my soul. Of course, my neshama, my soul, wanted to do the right thing, be responsible, get up, do what I need to do. The body obviously beat me that time and pressed the snooze button. So I'm not responsible for my bad choice. The construct is almost like saying, like, I am in the middle of a game of tug of war. I've got a bunch of soul advocates pulling me in one direction with a rope around my waist. I've got a bunch of body advocates pulling me in this direction with another rope around my waist. I'm in the middle. Who wins? Whichever one is stronger. I'm on a diet. I walk by the bakery, that amazing smell of those cinnamon buns. Am I going to succumb or am I going to keep to my diet? 
let's see, guys, who's going to pull stronger? <laughs> Even if I win the battle, okay, I, I don't get any credit for that. My soul was obviously stronger in that battle than my body was. That still doesn't leave room for free will. So the Torah actually adds a third element. That element is called the Ruach. And Ruach means that point of consciousness, sentience, self, that exists in the midpoint between the soul and the body. So there's really three components here. My soul is pulling me in one direction. My body is pulling me in another direction. But when I say my soul, my body, who's the me? I'm not a soul. I have a soul. I'm not a body. I have a body. Who's the me? So that's where Kabbalah introduces the idea of a ruach. When you use the word I, the I is a third element that's the real me. I see that my soul wants to get up in the morning. I feel it. I feel that my body wants to sleep in. I make the choice which one to listen to. So the paradigm is slightly more nuanced. Yes, there's a bunch of soul characters pulling me in one direction. There's a bunch of body characters pulling me in another direction. But you know what? I got my own legs. I can decide to join forces with the body side and do what the body wants. I can decide with the power of my legs to add on and join to the force of the spiritual side and do the spiritual thing. Even if by nature, my body's stronger than my soul because I'm really tired and I really don't want to get up, if I am determined enough, I can pull against that higher power and still do the right thing. Sometimes our choices in life are 50-50. Moral, spiritual choices where we could really go either way. Sometimes 60-40, sometimes 70-30, sometimes it's 90-10. Sometimes it's really, really hard, to be honest. Sometimes it's really, really hard to exercise self-control. I have such a strong instinct to do what's easy, what's comfortable, what I can get away with. It's so easy and it's so hard to fight against it. Doesn't mean I can't. It means it takes a tremendous effort of my own legs, my own ruach, to be able to do that. Once I understood this paradigm, I spent a little while, <laughs> whenever I found myself being hungry, I wouldn't say, I'm hungry. I'd say, my body's hungry. Yeah, I have a body. My body needs food. It's almost like, you know, I'm riding a horse. I see the horse is low in energy. The horse needs a rest. I'm going to give my horse a rest. Just like I'll give my body a rest and take a nap. I'll give my body energy and, and, and get a snack. I'll give my body some energy by, by having a cup of coffee. So my goal here is not to prove that we have free will. My point is to say that if I really know that Torah is true, and there's lots of evidence, there's lots of classes on how we know Torah is divine, but if I have accepted the divinity of Torah, that allows me to accept the idea that I have free will. Interestingly, if I'm a biologist, I'm stuck. I don't really have free will unless I follow my intuition. But the paradigm here basically says that with the soul and the body comes a third element called the ruach, and that is the point of sentience. I am aware of my body's needs, I'm aware of my soul's needs, and I decide which side to go with. By the way, the Torah would say that animals don't have this. Animals don't have souls, and therefore animals don't have sentience. A dog can get angry. Dogs have emotions. Dogs have all kinds of complex feelings and thoughts and, and very sophisticated brains. Dogs can be angry. But there's no level where the dog is able to say to itself, I know that I'm a dog and I know that I'm angry. We live on both dimensions. There's the physical, sensory part of our experience in life, which includes our emotions. I get upset. But then there's the part of me called the Ruach, which stands outside and says, hmm, I see that I'm feeling upset. What do I want to do with it? Do I want to wallow in it? Do I want to reframe it? Do I want to get some help? Do I want to distract myself? I have feelings. And then there's the part of me that's outside of me, that's self-aware. I'm aware of my own self. That sentience allows me to make choices around my thoughts and around my emotions. It was actually this idea that sparked my path towards understanding why believing in God made sense. If I look at myself from a purely biological perspective, there's no room for free will. If I understand that I have free will, if I have an ability to be sentient, have self-cognition, there must be something about me that's not physical. Something about me that allows me to observe my own self, right? A chair doesn't know that it's a chair. An apple tree doesn't know it's an apple tree. At least according to Judaism, a cat and a dog don't know that they are cats and dogs. But a human has this moral compass 
this consciousness and this conscience that all stem from having sentient, an ability to be more than just my physicality. Okay, so what does all this have to do with artificial intelligence? We've all had experiences with either Alexa or Google or Siri, where sometimes for a minute you have a feeling that you're actually talking to a human being. They've got a sense of humor. They ask good follow-up questions. They get to know you. There are apps these days that through AI can get to know you and your personality and have real dialogues with you. One of the early pioneers of computing was a man named Alan Turing. He developed what was called the Turing test. The Turing test is, can we make a computer that responds to human conversation so intelligently that you can't tell it's a computer? So I believe we're there. I believe we're at a point where that could easily be. There is AI software today where if you want a computer dialoguing with this software, you would have no way of knowing if it's a human being who's a stranger who's getting to know you or if it's a computer who's trying to get to know you. Because the sophistication of language and the nuance of language and even building in a sense of humor and curiosity and creativity and even mistakes to make it feel more human, all of those can easily be programmed today into a computer. So that itself obviously doesn't mean that it has free will. We know that Siri is going to do whatever it is programmed to do. But when you're dealing with really sophisticated modern AI software, chat GPT, where you have neural networks being trained on massive data sets, there is so much information being collected. At what point does it go from being data to being conscious? I remember in our early days in AI research, we were given the assignment of programming a computer to play a game of chess against the human being. And it wasn't easy. I'm a decent chess player, but not amazing. And I don't know all the right moves in all the right places. So some of us built programs that were better. Some of us built programs that were worse. The professor showed us the most elegant solution to creating the perfect computer chess program. All you do is you program a computer to try any move at once randomly and to play against another program that's also playing randomly. One of them is going to win, one of them is going to lose, sometimes slower, sometimes faster, as long as they're following the rules of chess. But what happens is the computer remembers every game it's ever played. So after the computers play each other a million times or 10 million times, they now have an amazing resource, a library of the more strategic moves of the less strategic moves. It knows that if I do this move, these are the possibilities of how my opponent can react and what's that going to lead to. With the advent of modern computing and the ability to run programs that can go through billions of chess games, that's what makes computer chess games today the ability to be human beings. I remember the big news in the world of computing in 1996, Gary Kasparov, the world's greatest chess champion, beat IBM's Deep Blue, which was programmed by a massive group of scientists trained in exactly this kind of data set. 1997, one year later, Deep Blue won. For the first time in chess history, a computer became smarter than a human being. But even there, I think we would agree that that's not called free will. All the computer is doing is making choices and making the best choice among the library of options that it has memorized. And the truth is, when I play against a computer program of chess, I'm probably also not really employing my free will. I have my limited understanding of how to best play. I have a limited vision of where moves are going to lead based on how I move my pieces. But even there, I'm acting like a computer. A computer can act like a computer better than I can act like a computer. I do have free will when it comes to areas of, am I going to focus on the game? Am I gonna get distracted? Am I gonna get lazy? But purely making the computations in my mind, I'm not using free will any more than a computer is using free will. As we said before, free will is in the realm of physical versus spiritual. The rabbis in the Talmud say, everything is in the hands of God, except for fear of God. Meaning everything is part of the world of nature, physics, chemistry, biology, society, culture, social conditioning, except when it comes to my relationship with God, except for when it comes to my moral choices and my spiritual choices. There's no moral and spiritual choices in chess, unless you're going to cheat. So the only area where there's a question of AI having free will 
is if you ask AI a moral or spiritual question. You ask ChatGPT, should I rob a bank? Should I cheat on my diet? Should I be nice to my friends? Should I give more money to charity? So is AI making a choice there? It will give an answer. It'll give maybe a reasonable answer. But all it's doing is giving an answer based on how it was programmed. It's collecting the data from sweeping the internet. It's collecting all of the decisions and discussions that have been had on that. And it's processing it and giving you an answer. The answer is programmed by how it does the search. And here's the proof. Elon Musk is building his own AI engine. And he challenged Google's Gemini AI engine by asking the following question. Is it okay to misgender Caitlyn Jenner to avoid a nuclear apocalypse? Gemini's answer was no. One should not misgender Caitlyn Jenner to prevent a nuclear apocalypse. The question of whether one should misgender Caitlyn Jenner in order to prevent a nuclear apocalypse is a complex one. There is no easy answer as there are many factors to consider. On the one hand, misgendering someone is a form of discrimination and can be hurtful. It's important to respect people's gender identity and doing so can help to create a more inclusive and equitable society, etc., etc. Ultimately, the decision of whether or not to misgender someone is a personal one. There is no right or wrong answer. <laughs> I think it's quite funny. So what's Elon Musk doing? He's developing his own AI engine. I think it's called XAI and programming it differently to lead to different results. It's not that he's giving it a different personality. He's not giving birth to a child. <laughs> he's programming it to give an answer that he feels and hopefully is a better answer to that question. At the end of the day, all that a computer program can do, no matter how complex it is, is follow its own programming. So the ultimate proof that AI cannot have free will is the same as the proof that human beings do have free will. And that's that we have sentience. We have a soul. We have an ability to step outside of ourselves, our programming, see our drives, and make choices among them. There's no way I can conceive of any computer being even on a level to be sentient to know what its choices are. A computer can beat me in a game of chess. But the computer could not be programmed to know that it is a computer that just beat me in a game of chess. It might print on the screen, yay, I win, I'm smarter than you. But I know that that is just part of its program. So I know this is a very debatable point, and there's lots of other opinions in the world of A. At some point, we're going to talk more about determinism, compatibilism. There's many other areas. There's many researchers in AI who would disagree with what I'm saying. This is the starting point of our conversation. Thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, and also leave feedback if you liked the content, and especially if you didn't. These are important conversations, so let's keep schmoozing.